is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Spanish inflation shows slows more than forecast as energy costs drop. Core only dips, underscoring the dilemma facing the ECB. German CPI hits later with the first date to report North Rhine-Westphalia showing a decline. The FDIC looks to shore up regional lenders. Bloomberg understands that regulators may force top U.S. banks to pick up a bigger share of the $23 billion tab for recent failures. Plus, Swiss regulators are said to have encouraged UBS to bring back Sergio Armadi as chief executive to ensure the smooth integration of Credit Suisse. Now, let's take a look at the markets. A lot of the focus will be on technology stocks and, of course, technology stocks having done quite well in the U.S. So European stocks in general climbing, partly catching up with the rally on Wall Street that we saw yesterday. Uh, the tech-heavy Nasdaq now into a bull market amid bets that a peak interest rates near and bank turmoil will continue to ease. Now, Bloomberg has learned that the FDIC may lean on big banks to help pay $23 billion hit it faces from the recent bank failures. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Managing Editor for Finance, Michael Moore. Mike, great to have you on the program. So what do we know about what's it going to cost uh, to actually try and contain these recent failures? Yeah, so this has knocked out about a fifth of the FDIC's deposit fund, and it's on banks to replenish that over the coming years. I think the, what is still up for debate is what bank gets what share, and the timing of it. So the special assessment that's being talked about would put more of it on the biggest banks and would make it a, a little sooner uh, than if it was done through regular assessments. Um, and, you know, there's precedents for that, but uh, the banks uh, aren't always big fans of the, a shock hit to their finances. Um, so what else can you tell us, Mike, about the U.S. banking system? I know we spoke to Mr. Schwartzman, Steve Schwartzman of Blackstone, saying that basically U.S. banking crisis is mostly solvable. I'm a bit worried about the most <laughs> in this. Yeah. Um, well, there's been a lot of discussion over the last couple of days on Capitol Hill of how can this be avoided going forward, what needs to change from a regulatory perspective. And, you know, I think what we... the consensus seems to be building around lowering that threshold of the size of bank that gets special attention or, or extra scrutiny. Uh, right now it's about $250 billion. There's been a lot, a lot of talk of $100 billion being kind of that new level of when they start to get more scrutinized. Mike, thank you so much. Michael Moore there joining us on the very latest with U.S. banks. Now, ECB executive board member Isabel Schnabel says Eurozone banks have not seen a loss of deposits despite the recent financial stability concerns. I think at the moment there is a lot of uncertainty about what the financial turbulence uh, means for us in the euro area. Overall, I would say at this point it looks that, uh, that uh, we have um, a somewhat smaller problem uh, than we are seeing uh, in the US. So at least so far uh, it looks that um, uh, as if our uh, banks were uh, actually quite uh, resilient. Well, joining us now is Catherine Nice, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income and Bloomberg's Christina Kina. So thank you both for joining us. Catherine, let's kick off with you. When you look at the dynamic of inflation, maybe a little bit of a slowdown for inflation, but core inflation, very sticky. What does it mean for what the ECB does next? Yeah, so far, I think the interesting thing is we've seen this turbulence coming from the U.S. and the banking sector, and all of the central banks that I cover over here in Europe effectively followed the same playbook and went ahead and raised interest rates uh, pretty much as they had been signaling well before those recent uh, events. And, and since then, we don't really get a sense that there's a lot of buyer's remorse from those central banks for having done that. If anything, the data flow have given them a bit more confidence that uh, that was uh, probably the right decision. Here in the UK, for example, we saw retail sales uh, coming in uh, pretty robustly. The services PMI in the euro area went further into uh, expansionary territory. So uh, I think it's too soon to say that uh, we can rule out further interest rate hikes here in Europe. 
Yeah, what's your take, actually, on what we're seeing across the board? And, and markets also pricing in, um, Christine, for example, the Fed cutting. I don't know what, when that goes away. Yeah, Francie, I mean, that was, of course, brought on by the mini banking crisis that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. But even that has faded away. Those cuts still remain in terms of bets, right? And I think this is the dilemma that markets are facing at the moment, is that there is, I think, still a, a, a desire to believe that a shift in the Fed's strategy is around the corner but you know the hawkish messages that we heard from Jay Powell earlier this month kind of pour cold water over that but then comes the banking crisis and traders are now oh maybe that would be the catalyst to get us back into thinking about rate cuts it, it, it's, it's really quite a whiplash month for for markets and there's really uh, very little sign that that sort of dynamic is going to fade anytime soon because if it's not the banking crisis I'm sure markets will find something else to worry about uh, in the near term, whether that's maybe a turn in, in the economic data or, you know, we keep hearing mm -hmm. again about um, signs of a credit crunch uh, to a small extent, you know, no. at the moment. But there's always a danger that turns into something bigger. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, what's your take then? What does it mean for where you want to be invested in? I mean, if you look at fixed income and some of the dynamics also with what the Fed does, what is the market mispricing right now? completely agree with Christine's uh, volatility point. What I would say is quite important uh, in terms of the takeaway from these uh, recent central bank decisions to go ahead and stick with their rate hiking cycle is that this doesn't mean that they're completely ignoring financial stability considerations. I think a big takeaway from the global financial crisis for central banks was uh, we cannot divide and conquer here and as a monetary authority just focus on price stability without consideration for financial stability. Equally, since then, I think it is well understood uh, among central banks that interest rates are too blunt an instrument to, quote unquote, you know, lean against uh, the wind of uh, financial stability risks. So we're really in a situation somewhere in the middle. And most of the central banks that I cover here in Europe do, by and large, explicitly acknowledge financial stability considerations in their flexible inflation targeting frameworks. So concretely, what I think that means is that from here on out, uh, other things equal, expect a shallower uh, rate hiking path and uh, yeah. 75 basis point hikes are probably a thing of the past. Yeah. So, so what is priced, what is mispriced in fixed income right now, Catherine? Well, as, as Christine said, there's a lot of volatility. Uh, my take is we've had a bit of a, a major correction last year that created uh, you know, a lot of pain across the industry, but it's also created a lot of value. Uh, the volatility itself speaks to doing a bottom-up assessment, looking for uh, pockets of value in those areas where, where we see them. And, um, Christine, when you look at, you know, the credit crunch, and this is the main worry in the U.S., but also we've seen figures and we have some great Bloomberg charts looking at some of the flows, and this was even pre-banking crisis. Is this really the one thing that regulators and policymakers worry about? I, I think so, Francine. I mean, we've increasingly seen uh, regulators and authorities commenting on this. The Bank of England yesterday, for instance, highlighting the credit crunch as one main vulnerability uh, in the U.K. at the moment. And I think that that extends to um, a lot of developed economies. Credit is always the canary that sings every time we're about to hit a downturn. This is what we saw in 2008 as well, and I think that is why we're worried about it again this time around, right? It is the idea of funding just seizing up for smaller businesses and the idea that we are potentially, uh, we could potentially see a raft of businesses just not existing anymore because they can't afford to exist. Um, and so that is very much still the worry. That was kind of what was all we revived uh, with the banking turmoil of the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks and it's something that investors I think are more um, highly tuned to mm -hmm. now that we've seen uh, the banking woes even though that has faded in the uh, slight in the background mm -hmm. uh, credit worries.
countries are still here to stay for some time. Great. Thank you so much, both of you. Catherine Nice there, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income, stays with us. And thank you to Bloomberg's Christina Kino. Now, Jim O'Neill, former UK government minister, Goldman Sachs chief economist, explained what's happening in the industry now, saying whenever interest rate rises sharply, the weak get found out. What's the great phrase? History never repeats itself, but it rhymes. So we'll get back to Catherine and ask her a little bit about the banking sector, what that means for possible contagion across Europe. Now, he spoke uh, to myself and David Merritt on Bloomberg's In the City podcast. You can subscribe to that on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's the new episode out today. Coming up, Swiss regulators encouraged UBS's move to bring back Sergio Amati as chief executive. We'll have plenty more on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg has learned that Swiss regulators have encouraged UBS's decision to bring back Sergio Armadi as chief executive to ensure a smooth integration of Credit Suisse. Now, the UBS veteran will step down from his chairmanship at the insurer Swiss Re and retake the role that he held for nine years after UBS's AGM next week. Now, for more on all of this, let's go straight to Zurich and to Bloomberg's Swiss banking reporter, Miriam Belezu. Miriam, great to have you on the show today. What do we know about Armadi as a UBS returner? So this is actually his second stint um, at UBS and um, Emoti was called back because of his ex extensive um, expertise. Um, this, is really, um, this is really the restructuring man that they called back uh, for, for this and um, he's previously um, helped with another uh, restructuring and, and bringing UBS back um, on track. So he's got over a decade um, of experience at, at UBS, so that will definitely help uh, with the transition and um, also, you know, the scale of the merger, the scale of the integration of these two banks. You needed someone with experience um, of that magnitude and really MOT was the, the, the right man for that um, and he's got all the experience, he knows the bank inside out. Um, he also had that kind of external um, perspective because he stepped away for a few years and it's good to also look at it from uh, the outside. So he was really the, the right man for, for the job. So, Miriam, talk to me a little bit about yesterday. We broke the news, thanks to all of our great sourcing and reporting in Zurich, that policymakers were behind this change. Tell us more. Um, so this is an, um, this is still um, you know uh, under discussions, but they were discussions that the um, government was also kind of influencing the the decision. But the decision came from from UBS's management and from that phone call, late night phone call from Kelleher um, to Emoti. So this was the it was UBS's initiative, but definitely mm -hmm. got the you know, kind of the green light from from um, the government um, in that respect. Yeah, always good to get a green light. Thank you so much, Our Swiss banking reporter Miriam Belezu. Now still with us, Catherine Nice, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Catherine, how much do you worry about the banking crisis becoming something else and maybe infecting the European economy? I think we'll always worry. These things have a way of taking on a life of their own. Uh, that said, I think there are good reasons to take uh, some comfort that the situation in Europe is, is quite a bit different than uh, what we've seen elsewhere. Uh, for example, regulatory and supervisory oversight in, in Europe is, is much more consistently applied across the banking sector. There are fewer uh, carve-outs, discretionary carve-outs based on size of the bank, for example. And the UK is, is very much seen to have gold-plated its application of Basel III on UK banks. And so mm -hmm. I think these things are going to give policymakers some comfort as as your clip of, of Schnabel, uh, I think, suggested. Um, 
what I would say, though, however, is is even in that scenario where perhaps the market does move on from testing out uh, European banks, it's not clear that we're completely out of the woods yet here in Europe, because mm -hmm. I would not be surprised to see attention shift in pretty short order, potentially, to sovereigns. And whenever that's the case, of course, uh, that puts Italy uh, right yeah. back into the frame. And Italy is very... Um, um, Italian banks in particular are very exposed to Italian sovereign bonds. And I think this, mm -hmm. uh, if, if this risk were to crystallize, we could see the ECB's resolve on the use of its transmission protection instrument that it unveiled last year uh, come very much into, into focus. So, uh, Catherine, if, for example, I mean, you basically say that now the weakest link and certainly the weakest link in the banking sector is Italy. Is there anything that policymakers or that the government can do now to make sure that there is no position of trouble? Well, well, just to clarify my point, um, it was that the market may shift its focus away from banks and to sovereigns. Uh, so when we're thinking about that bank sovereign nexus, rather than potentially the banks being the trigger in Europe, we could see that it's the sovereigns, in which case, uh, you know, I think clearly Italy comes into to the frame. And there, uh, you know, policymakers in, in Europe have been busy. They have been uh, at work trying to weaken these links within the sovereign bank nexus. Uh, we talked already about the additional buffers that are put in place to strengthen banks, to weaken that link from banks to sovereigns. And we've seen uh, work that's done by solo policymakers to weaken the link from sovereigns to banks in the form of this PEP flexibility, as well as uh, the uh, introduction of this TPI mm -hmm. instrument. But these things have been untested. And uh, I think we can't rule out that in this very volatile uh, environment, huge uncertainty, that uh, yeah. some of these parameters could get tested. Thank you so much, Catherine Nieser, Chief European Economist at PGM Fixed Income. Coming up, Europe puts its foot down in the race to source lithium for electric vehicles. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. This week, a rock tech lithium broke ground on a refinery outside Berlin that will feed Germany's car industry. It's the latest step in Europe's race to build the EV supply chain within the continent, which currently imports all of its lithium from abroad. Now, for more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Oli Crook live from Berlin. Oli, good morning. So how significant is this project and how does it fit in Europe's industrial strategy? So we look at all of the kind of inputs into this equation. As you say, lithium is all imported right now from the EU, and the auto sector is Germany's biggest industry. And this is a continent that basically wants to ban the sale of new combustion engine vehicles by 2035. In industrial terms, that's not that far away. So what Europe needs to do is to secure its supply chain. Part of that is securing this, lithium rock. So this is what this refinery will process. It will break it down. It will heat it up. It will process it. And out of that, you'll get lithium hydroxide, and that will go into the cars. And by the time time it's finished, it's supposed to start producing in 2025, and by the time it reaches its full capacity, it'll be enough for 500,000 car batteries. 40% of that annual output goes straight to Mercedes. But you think about the timelines here. I asked the CEO, is Europe too late, and can they fall behind in a permanent way? This is uh, definitely a risk. Um, but I am very sure, and also out of uh, a lot of personal meetings, that the European politicians are aware of this topic. And uh, I see a significant change in the attitude here in, in Europe since this IRA program has been passed. So the alarm signs are clearly here. The politicians are willing to act. Now we will see in the coming weeks uh, if they will be able to. So the alarm signs are here in Europe. The question is, will the alarms be loud enough for Europe to respond in a big way to China, which processes currently 70 percent of the world's lithium? So you think about concentration risk that we learned from the war in Russia and gas supply to Germany. This is very much in the forefront here in Germany. Oli, thank you so much. Oli Crook there with the very latest, of course, on lithium. He also has some lithium, which he just comes out with, you know, he had in his pocket. So I want to see more of that shortly. Let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. 
Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned that the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation may ask big lenders to pay extra to cover the cost of recent bank failures. Our sources say it could be part of the agency's so-called special assessment that will be announced in May. The FDIC has said it expects to pay close to $23 billion to cover deposits at SVB and Signature Bank. Now, the UK is set to outline its strategy to speed up the deployment of renewable power and carbon capture has been billed as a response to green subsidies to President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, but the measures in a draft document seen by Bloomberg show little in the way of actual spending. Now, Premier Li Keqiang has called China a, quote, anchor for world peace. In a keynote speech at a forum that included global business and government leaders, Li also expressed optimism about the recovery in the world's second biggest economy. He added that China will continue continue to pursue stability, expand domestic demand, open the economy and safeguard the financial sector. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans and this is Bloomberg Francine. Well, yeah, and thank you so much. Now, European stocks are co climbing, uh, partly catching up with the rally on Wall Street that we saw yesterday. So let's look at exactly what's happening in some of these indices here in Europe. You can see European stock 600 gaining 8 tenths of 8%. Again, the Nasdaq heavy, of course, the tech heavy Nasdaq uh, went into bull market amid bets that a peak in interest rate is near. Coming up this week on Bloomberg UK, we take a special look at security and defense with the former British spy master, Sir Richard Dearlove. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, with war in Ukraine and heated debate around the possible data threat of companies like TikTok, today's show is a deep dive into British security policy. So what role does the UK play in the global security order? As one of the founding members of NATO, the UK continues to play a key role, leading the call to support Ukraine following Russia's invasion last year. Now, the UK has also been instrumental in intelligence sharing. MI6 Chief Richard Moore tweeted last year about working with the US to uncover Putin's plans for Ukraine. Critics said Brexit could damage the security relationship with Brussels, but thawing relations amid war in Europe and the Windsor framework could lead to closer ties. Then there's a Five Eyes intelligence partnership between the UK, the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And then AUK US, a wide ranging security partnership which will see the UK and the US providing Australia with nuclear powered submarines to counter Chinese naval threats in the Indo Pacific. Earlier this month, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said China poses what he called an epoch defining challenge to the international world order. Well, Sunak has also committed to spending £20 billion a year on technology innovation, including AI and cyber security. Now, in a moment, we'll be speaking to Sir Richard Dearlove, who was in charge of the UK's foreign spy agency, MI6. He was at the heart of British secret intelligence for nearly 40 years, including during the invasion of Iraq. But first, let's get straight to our expert panel. Bloomberg's Jordan Robertson covers security. Ross Matheson on geopolitics and the biggest threats to the UK. And Tim Craighead from Bloomberg Intelligence on UK military and defense. So thank you all for joining us. Ross, let's start off with you. If you look at security around the world, of course, the world has become much more uncertain since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What does the UK fit in all of this? Well, as you were noting, the UK really is embedded in a lot of the security architecture around the world. Obviously, a key member of NATO um, in the AUKUS uh, grouping uh, with Australia and the US on, on submarines. Uh, and so, and, and obviously, the Five Eyes intelligence uh, sharing operation also. But since Brexit, of course, the UK is no longer part of the EU. And so, there's a sense that some of that kind of coordination uh, it has gone and the UK really is to a greater extent defining its own future when it comes to foreign policy and security. And how does that 
mean the UK responds to some of those kind of growing global threats, not just Russia with its invasion of Ukraine, but obviously the growing influence of China globally, uh, the use of cyber war uh, globally, uh, the rise of other non-state actors. And these are real fundamental challenges for the UK mm. to think about and what kind of alliances can it have that it can uh, join up with other countries to sort of counter those things. It's very much aligning itself with the US, for example, against China. It's been a very strong critic of Russia for its war in Ukraine. But what about the threats that are coming directly to the UK potentially mm -hmm. over the years from that? There doesn't seem to be a lot of strategic thinking going on about, about that in particular. And Jordan, when you look at you know the threats uh, looking at us at the moment, of course, partly it's on the battlefield, especially when we look at the horrific images from Ukraine. But cybersecurity is really the next frontier. Have these you know threats become more complicated and more intuitive to deal with? Sure. It, you know, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, one of the things that didn't happen was a major cyber war along the lines of what we've seen in the past. Um, <clears throat> or what many people feared. But what did happen was, you know, uh, Russia's invasion showed mm -hmm. that cyber weapons are a natural complement to traditional kinetic, you know, military mm -hmm. weapons. And, you know, the UK's role in this, the UK has vast diplomatic and intelligence gathering reach, you know, despite Brexit. Um, and uh, the UK will play a very big role, uh, you know, in the future in terms of gathering big data, sharing data with the, its intelligence partners and its military partners. But this is what, is it from state-sponsored threats or is it private threats? Both. I, you know, it's a good question because what's happened in the last, especially decade, is the tools for cyber attacks have become democratized. So you have cyber hacking criminal groups who have the same, ac who have access to the same tools and, uh, and cyber weapons, as in many cases, nation states. So the, the difference between them is, uh, has become blurred, um, you know, whether it's in the UK or yeah. the US or, you know, throughout Europe. Um, Tim, so you cover this from, from, of course, a business angle, right? When you look at defense spending overall, it's increased you know, across major Western economies. What's it looking like in the UK? So I, I guess there are a couple of things here to consider. Number one, it's, it's definitely ramping, both in the wake, as we've discussed, with Russia invading Ukraine, as well as uh, the, the ongoing uh, concern about what's going on from China and Asia. The UK has increased its budget. I think we're all aware it got a significant um, uh, potential spur when Liz Truss came in and it was going to be 3% of GDP. Um, it's now pulled back under Sunak's perspective and the 2% the sort of number still seems right. Um, that's increasing as it is elsewhere. The thing that's interesting to consider, though, is what's happening with that budget spend with Russia, Ukraine, versus what would have happened if that, if that conflict hadn't occurred. A lot of it's going to munitions and refilling supply on the ground. Some of these bigger issues longer term are more oriented towards air and sea yep. and cyber. And is there a deflection of some of that strategic spend that's happening because you've got to have tanks and munitions and other things <laughs> in Ukraine? That's an interesting conflict. And, and Tim, overall, the UK, I mean, we think about, you know, Lockheed Martin, a lot of the big companies. Actually, the UK has, has a lot of defense companies. There, there are. It's actually a, it, it's a significant employer across the UK, um, a significant you know, amount of revenue. Some of that certainly is coming from U.S. defense primes, but specifically in the U.K., think BAE Systems and think Rolls-Royce. Um, they're both quite critical. And BAE is, it is in an interesting situation because not only are they involved with European programs yeah. like the Typhoon from a plane, uh, but they're, they're, a, they're a tier one defense supplier for the U.S. involved on ships, planes, tanks, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. And certainly they're involved now with this uh, Australian uh, JV. Um, Roz, if you look at intelligence sharing, I mean, this is really one of the big takeaways from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that especially the U.S., of course, authorities had leaked it. People knew about it. I imagine it, it helped also uh, the Ukraine, you know, um, the politicians to, to prepare for it. Post-Brexit, what does intelligence sharing look like? 
Well, certainly at least the Five Eyes intelligence grouping is still very much intact and very robust. And as you say, it was highly unusual to see the US releasing so publicly the level of intelligence that they gleaned about Russia before it went into Ukraine and indeed after the invasion happened. That's That's been quite unusual. And that intelligence has been clearly shared uh, not just between the US and UK, but also the US and Europe uh, and big intelligence sharing operations that are going on within Europe itself. So that machinery seems to be pretty much intact. And certainly, despite Brexit, there's a sense that that needs to continue happening, even if the UK says they want to sort of forge their own path to some extent when it comes to foreign policy, when it comes to its own security architecture. There's a recognition that it's the interests of everybody to do so. The question is, how does that translate to other challenges as they go on? For example, again, China, in the longer term, as the US says, you know, the real, the real challenge geopolitically around the world is going to be a multipolar existence uh, with the US and China both as superpowers. And so how does that intelligence sharing translate to that. But right now, it seems pretty robust. So who's the biggest ally of the UK, Roz, right now in terms of intelligence sharing? I imagine the US is still more important than the EU. You'd have to say so. And obviously, there's been a long-standing transatlantic uh, special relationship, as they like to say, between the US and the UK. And that's hit a few bumps in the road uh, in recent years, but seems to be on a pretty good track at the moment. And certainly, the orca steel uh, on submarines points to that. So certainly, you'd have to say that probably the biggest sort of security ally at the moment for the UK is the US. And Jordan, when you look at cybersecurity, and again, you know, we, th we think a lot about state-sponsored, uh, you know, attacks versus, you know, against, for example, government websites, but it can also be private website. How's the UK in trying to counteract some of these threats? Are they, are they doing a good job? They seem to be investing quite a lot in it. You know, the cybersecurity industry is bigger than it's ever been. It's, you know, it's a multi, multi-billion dollar industry every year. And that includes the UK, right? I mean, the UK as a, a central hub for banking and, mm -hmm. and the financial services. That's one of the biggest markets for cybersecurity technologies. The banks buy more cybersecurity technologies than most other industries. Um, you know, so as a result, there's a really healthy ecosystem in the UK, maybe not perhaps of the startups that you would see in the mm -hmm. US, but in terms of consumption and in terms of the number of people employed in the UK, you know, in cyber roles, th that number is actually pretty high relative to the UK size. Um, you know, so as a result of that, you know, what you have is a lot of intelligence being gathered and a lot of information being gathered. Um, and as a result, the UK remains a very important partner for the US and Europe because of that. They see oh, a lot. They see a lot. Thank you all for a fantastic panel. Jordan Robertson, Ros Matheson and Tim Craighead. Now coming up, more coverage on UK security. Sir Richard Dearlove, the former head of Britain's MI6 spy agency, joins us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to our special coverage on UK security policy. Now joining us now is Sir Richard Dearlove. He was at the heart of British secret intelligence for 38 years and served as head of MI6 from 1999 to 2004. Sir Richard was the country's top spy during the invasion of Iraq. Well, he joins us now, former head of Britain's MI6 spy agency. Sir Richard, thank you for joining us. When you look at intelligence sharing, how has the war in Ukraine, but also Brexit, changed the place of the UK in the world? Well, I think it's important to understand that Brexit probably hasn't made a great deal of difference to what happens in Europe, because the um, policy of the UK was really to make sure that the European Commission did not <clears throat> have much purchase on its national security policy. So as a result um, of that, I mean, life has continued pretty much as it was before and after. I, I, I think what I would say is Ukraine has, of course, acted as a catalyst and yeah. probably um, pushed the UK again to the forefront of European security, particularly in the intelligence and the security field. I mean, the UK remains really the primary uh, intelligence and security nation or power in the European context. And I think you can assume it's played a massively important role, both uh, in the build-up to war in Ukraine and now uh, in terms of helping the Ukrainians and playing a central role in the alliance of nations supporting Ukraine. 
So, so Richard, what would make it even more prominent? Is there anything that the UK needs to do? I don't know whether it's common platforms with its allies beyond some of the bilateral agreements that would give it more prominence for intelligence sharing. Uh, I would have thought that the situation is probably operating at an optimum. And I, I think that the misleading view of Brexit is that it might have changed things. Look, it didn't really change much at all because the UK, as I've said already, was very careful not to put national security equities yeah. into the hands of Brussels. It wasn't a publicly stated policy, but it was pretty clear throughout that period that, you know, we weren't going to, as it were, allow the EU much say in those areas. It was done very discreetly. From the time you were head of MI6 to now, what do you think that the biggest changes have been in terms of defence and security threats? Has it moved tactically to everything online, to cybersecurity threats? Obviously, the technology now plays a much greater role in both intelligence collection and, you know, intelligence vulnerabilities. Uh, I think that's quite obvious. So cyber becomes more prominent and mm -hmm. any sort of technical intelligence cap capability would be a much bigger deal. I mean, you know, the collection of data, the analysis of data. And I think, you know, during my career, I was really in the foothills of those issues. We hadn't yet, as it were, climbed the mountains. But I mean, now I think, <clears throat> I think it's important to accept though that human intelligence sources and human intelligence collection probably still remains a core activity. So, you know, you've got to look at the balance of those two issues, how all those various sources, collection sources are integrated. So the world probably is more complex. Um, and I think the other thing one has to acknowledge that there's much more public awareness now of the role of intelligence collection agencies in crises. And I mean, look at the build up to the war in Ukraine when a lot of sensitive intelligence was publicized before the invasion actually happened. Yeah, that was the first time I saw anything like that. What did you think at the time when this intelligence, we were told then that this was to basically prevent Vladimir Putin from attacking Ukraine and saying it was their fault? Yeah, well, I think that there have been some famous ex historical examples um, go back to Cuba and the Cuban crisis. Uh, you know, which was really before my career even started. Uh, that was a prime example. Um, another example, topical, because it's the 20th anniversary of the war in Iraq. And, OK, mistakes were made, and one ended up in a rather different analysis after the event of what had happened. But I know mean, there have always been occasions in international relations where intelligence has been used. Yeah. Uh, but, but I think sir, this was probably a prime example of and, mm. and maybe one of the most impressive in the US and the UK, I think, got this absolutely right this time. Uh, so, Richard, how do you expect the war in Ukraine to end? Will Vladimir Putin be deposed? Or, and, and what is the role in the UK in this? I think it's far too early to say. At the moment, we have a conflict of attrition. I think if it goes bad militarily for the Russians, and things are not going well for them, then there is probably a fragility about Putin's situation in Russia. And uh, I think one could possibly see that evolve towards some sort of coup, some sort of political change in Moscow. But I, I don't think we should rely on that as a prediction. I think a lot will depend on what happens in the next six to eight months. I think we're on the cusp probably of a Ukrainian spring offensive. I, I, the Ukrainians are very good at, as it were, misleading the media into saying it's not going to happen now. But I, I think one should anticipate something dramatic will happen in the next few months in the conflict. And is it clear to you if China's a friend or, or, or a foe in this conflict, actually, to the West? Uh, I think China's position is deliberately ambiguous. Um, obviously, there is an alliance of interest at the moment between Russia and China. But I think China is, as it were, handling that relationship with caution. And mm -hmm. China will be calculating where 
does the advantage in this situation lie for China? I mean, we've just seen uh, in uh, Beijing, you know, something equivalent to the Davos uh, Chinese gathering attended by a lot of, of Western businesses. So we have to realize, you know, that China's economy is intertwined with the West. This is not a Cold War situation. China will play its cards carefully. And, you know, despite the expressions of friendship expressed during Xi Jinping's visit uh, to uh, Moscow, I, I, I think one can see there is caution yeah. in the way the Chinese are so, Richard, thank you so much. So, Richard Dearlove, former head of Britain's MI6 spy agency, stays with us, and we'll talk a little bit about the new threats out there. This is Weaver. Welcome back to our special coverage on UK security policy. Sir Richard Dearlove, former head of Britain's foreign spy agency, MI6, is still with us. Sir Richard, when you look at non-state actors and the threats that they pose, is there a new threat emerging that we haven't thought about yet? I wouldn't say there's a new threat emerging, but I think one should appreciate the seriousness that organizations which are not nation states or, as it were, aspire to be significant globally can mount threats and create problems. I mean, we're all familiar with the terrorist organizations that have been so problematic, um, both before, but particularly since 9-11. Um, there are very sophisticated criminal organizations which operate like global businesses, uh, particularly you know, in areas like the drugs trade, people trafficking. I mean, we're familiar with those types of problem and the difficulties of, of dealing with them. So, yeah, there are important players. And uh, I mean, one of the aspects of the technology that makes our lives so uh, exciting and, and, and varied and convenient is that, you know, this same technology can be used to support the aspirations of, right. of, of, of evil organizations. Okay. Would you consider TikTok evil? It's been banned from UK government devices. Is the UK government doing enough? Uh, well, it's been banned from official um, communications. I, I mean, the, the threat with TikTok uh, and, and similar businesses, uh, let's say based in China, uh, is their ability to collect data and the fact that that data you know, remains on service inside China. Now, we're all well aware of Chinese legislation. If the Chinese party leadership, the Chinese administration, says to a company, jump, and the response is how high? I mean, they can't turn around and say no. And I think we all realize in this complex technological world that we live in, you know, I think the quotation I've heard, data is the new oil. I mean, data is power. Data can be used. Uh, in a very manipulated fashion. So, I, I mean, there is a real problem with TikTok. And, you know, the enthusiasm of our youth for TikTok is, I think, unsettling in terms, because they don't understand, you know, what the security implications are that lie behind it. Do you see this as one of the biggest threats as the world becomes really, you know, polarized and bifurcated? Well, I think if we, uh, you know, if our, if our, competitive relationship with China turns into something much more serious, then uh, we have empowered China through a certain degree of negligence by letting China, uh, mm -hmm. as it were, acquire a lot mm -hmm. of data would be a powerful weapon if used against us. And I think one you know, has to understand that you know, China has an ulterior plan and an arterial motor through to 20, 2049 so when it dominant supervisor. Thank you so much, Sir Richard Dearlove, their former head of MI6. This is Bloomberg.
the moment, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the financial turbulence uh, means for us in the euro area. The stress in the banking sector is not sufficient uh, to really uh, lead to a pause here in rate hikes. The risk of a sudden deposit outflow is less severe here in Europe than it is uh, for some of those U.S. banks. This is an industry where the American big banks lead the global financial system. Every day that goes by, we're getting more stability. Barring any other major shocks, I think it's, it's behind us. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Buckle up your seatbelts while stock reversals have dipped buyers on the brink of an historic year. Big U.S. banks uh, may have to pay up. The FDIC faces almost $23 billion in costs from bank collapses and may shift a larger than usual portion of that burden to larger lenders. And the inflation rate in Spain falls almost in half, but persistent underlying price pressures cause problems for the ECB as it decides how much to raise interest rates. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And the inflation story uh, really uh, central here in Europe and in the US later. We'll get PCE data out of the US later on, Matt, won't we? Oh, it seems almost retro to get a chance to focus back on inflation after the turmoil we've seen and experienced in the banking sector. Yeah, and it should give us uh, a lift if we get the kind of positive surprises that you've seen in Europe as well. Not that we need it, right, because we already have achieved uh, a re-entry into the bull market for the NASDAQ 100. I'll show you that in just a moment. But first off, let's take a look at what's going on right now. S&P futures up about four-tenths of one percent after the big gains that we saw yesterday in the cash trade. We were up one and a half percent on um, the S&P, up almost two percent on the NASDAQ. The 10-year yield rising a little bit as investors let go of some of that debt, just to 357.72, so a couple of basis points from where we were at this point yesterday. And the Bloomberg dollar index continues to decline. So that's a real tailwind for risk assets. You know, a strong dollar tends to hold us back. A weaker dollar, uh, good not only for U.S. stocks, but uh, also for other indexes. And then NYMEX crude, right now rising 79 cents a barrel to 73 76, but you've got a couple of really interesting stories in um, the oil patch. First off, puts are a lot more expensive than calls for WTI. So that indicates that traders see um, U.S. So NYMEX crude down uh, as Brent is more popular in the future. And uh, we have another story um, showing that WTI could replace Brent in um, the dated benchmark, which would be really interesting, but it's kind of wonky. Take a look at NASDAQ uh, 100 right now. This uh, since the lows of December 28th, now up more than 20 percent. So that's what we uh, mean when we say a bull market, a technical bull market. Uh, investors really have been um, getting behind global tech stocks. We're going to talk uh, with a couple of our um, uh, markets guests about that. But I know you've been talking about it as well uh, this morning, Anna. So um, this is just one more vote. Uh, markets voting with their feet in terms of um, getting behind and supporting global tech. Mm. Yeah, and some people saying, yeah, sure, it might be a bull market, but is this some? Uh, is this just a rally within a broader bear market? I spoke to one guest on radio who was drawing my attention to a rally in tech stocks we saw in the middle of 2000 and drawing parallels with that, which is an interesting history lesson to a uh, memory lane to go down, isn't it? This is what European markets look like right now, Matt. Positive, picking up on that positivity that continued on Wall Street yesterday, uh, filtering through into European markets and most sectors in Europe in positive territory. Real estate doing well, retail doing well, bouncing back from the losses of yesterday, where retail was a real laggard for the economy. More on that in just a moment. Uh, this is the German two-year yield. Uh, we've actually got quite a fluctuating picture when it comes to uh, the yield story across Europe today. Earlier, we had seen some instant response to the German inflation data. We've had not the national number, but various regions of Germany gradually through the morning, building a picture towards that national number, which comes out early afternoon European time. And it was certainly moving in the right direction for most people's perspective. It was coming down quite substantially from the previous month. That's what the data is suggesting we will see uh, and that's what the data for the regions has been saying and so we had seen the uh, the yields jumping or the, the bond markets jumping on that story and moving yields accordingly uh, but then the euro has shown some strength maybe this is to do with a bit of dollar weakness that we've got going on maybe that's actually the dominant theme but also maybe it's just underlining if you look at some of the detail and certainly this was the case in Spain if you look at some of the detail yes headline inflation might be moving in the right direction in Europe but is the core remaining pretty sticky and that seems to be what uh, is, is driving thinking this morning this is 
Drax Group, an energy business in the UK, down by 6.4%. I put this in because they were trying to get approval for a carbon capture and support for a carbon capture project uh, from the UK government. They failed to secure that. Meanwhile, they are getting subsidies and support for their work in the United States on similar stuff to do with biomass energy and the way they capture uh, carbon on that front. So interesting one, uh, getting a lot of attention here in the UK. And H&M is up by 14% today. A real contrast from that retail story yesterday that sent the retail so uh, sector lower. That was driven by Next. Today, H&M posting a surprise profit to do with second-hand clothing market, which is interesting, uh, but also to do with taking action on that inventory overhang, which has affected this business for some six years, Matt. Yeah, the inventory overhang, um, getting rid of that was also part of the Lululemon story yesterday. So uh, that seems to be a theme among the more successful retailers. Let's get back to tech, though. The NASDAQ 100 index ended yesterday more than 20% above its de December closing low. It's a threshold that's considered the start of a new bull market technically. The gain came amid a broad risk on rally. Joining us now for more on the latest stock market action is Bloomberg's Danny Berger. And Danny, we've just been seeing, you know, buy the dip really pay off for investors that are willing to take that risk, haven't we? Yeah, and, and it might be one of the reasons, Matt, that this equity market seems to continue to fight gravity, despite the fact that we now have a market pricing in cuts, which would suggest recession or, or something bad. The fact that we're still even, on the other hand, worried about inflation. The fact we just went through a banking crisis, the S&P still stays pinned around the 4,000 level. But the fact that you can keep buying the dip, and on average it is making you money, means that it can keep heading higher, at least for now. On average, every down day this year has been followed by 0.3% gains. If the S&P continues that throughout the rest of the year, and of course, we have a whole lot more of this year to go, that will be the best year for dip buying, the second best year for dip buying on record. So it's all these risky things, all these things that have been beaten up. It's not just the overall index. It's tech, as you've been mentioning, Matt, that was beaten up to start the year. Everyone was short it. Those shorts got killed. It's even the most risky stocks when it comes to to credit. Uh, in front of me, I have a chart that is the most leveraged companies. Even those have started to come back in the past few days. So dip buying is working. So people are still doing it until that psychology changes. We might see the S&P hang on around 4,000. Yeah, that's an interesting one. And what does all this mean for the Fed and how does the Fed narrative link in is interesting to consider then, Danny. Mm -hmm. and, and I read a story earlier that suggested that Jerome Powell, well, he was pressed by members of the Republican Party on the future pace of hikes and he cited the dot plot. And then I asked myself, is he trying to communicate something new here or is this just the sensible, conservative response of a public official who's asked, what do you think? And he says, well, I refer you to what <laughs> I previously said. It just feels like such a Powell answer to say I'm not going to deviate from the script I'm just going to point you to the dot plot so it shows uh, that Congress people uh, don't get any different of a Jay Powell than us reporters do but yes he points to the dot plot this was the representative from Oklahoma that was talking about this closed door meeting that they had with Powell he just said look at the dot plot the dot plot indicates year end we're going to get to 5.1 percent which yes indicates one more rate hike but it comes back to this thing of a, the market pricing in cuts Powell keeps saying that is not their base case, be it to Congress, uh, be it in his, uh, in his presser. So th there's still this market disconnect, Matt. Yeah, he continues to tell markets, don't count on cuts this year, um, but they continue to disbelieve him. Danny, thanks so much. Danny Berger talking us through uh, by the dip being a successful strategy in this market. Let's get over to Europe right now because the EC uh, President Ursula von der Leyen is giving a speech on EU-China relations ahead of her trip to China with French President Emmanuel Macron. We're joined by Bloomberg's European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, out of Brussels. So what is von der Leyen telling us, Maria? And how um, is this incredibly important EU-China relation? Yes, and look, Matt, this is a speech that everyone, everyone is paying attention to in Brussels. It is seen perhaps as a roadmap to how to deal with China, because the reality is this is a very complex but also very difficult uh, relationship. And you are in Berlin and you're reporting on this for many years to manage for the EU because it is so multifaceted. Now, I just did a panel with uh, Mr. Timmermans, the head of the Green Deal for the EU, who told me, we can't fully cut off our economic ties with China, but we've got to de-risk. But you also have to engage with them on the climate. And then on top of that, you have the security aspect. Now, von der Leyen is speaking as we speak. Uh, I know that she will focus also, too, on the war in Ukraine and Russia. Okay. And Matt, there is disappointment from a number of European officials 
with this idea that President Xi Jinping is not doing enough to rein in Vladimir Putin. I mean, he went to Russia for three days, and the next thing you got was an announcement from the Kremlin that they were going to put tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus. So this idea that China could help de-escalate for many European officials simply has not manifested. China is not doing enough. The timing of the speech is also very important because, as you said, she will be going to China accompanied by the French president, Emmanuel Macron. Now, we're being told the message that they want to send is that this is a relationship that will now be done through the EU, not Germany, not the French, not individual countries, but the EU speaking as 27. Mm. So that's the geopolitics of the morning then, Maria. On the economic front, we got inflation data out of Spain. We've seen the regions of Germany building, giving their data, building towards that national number later on, and we get Eurozone inflation later this week. Now, the Spanish number, really uh, incredible for those who want to see inflation coming down. It came in below estimates, but importantly, it dropped from 6% last month to 3.3%. That sounds like great news if you're looking to, to see the back of this, this high inflation level, but core remains pretty sticky. Uh, yeah, and you have Spanish inflation, and obviously you call in the Spanish uh, reporter here at hand, which happens <laughs> to be, well, me. Uh, look, this is a data point that I know very well because I used to cover it for many, many years. When you look at Spanish inflation, you really have to make a difference between the headline inflation and the core. Headline inflation, as soon as energy goes down, will immediately go down. And that is the reason why we've seen it half, essentially, uh, today. When you look at core inflation, what it shows is that it is still sticky. It is not coming down. Although I would say, and this is very Spanish, is that the way it gets measured is slightly different to how other European countries would do it. So maybe the definition about around core is different. Overall, however, what it shows on the bigger picture is that the European Central Bank has said, for two weeks now, they do not see a trade-off between price stability and financial stability. As soon as a conversation around banks comes down, you're back to how much are we going to hike. And that takes us to May, where obviously the expectation at the time will be another rate increase. The question is, mm. how big? Maria, thank you very much. Maria today in Brussels with the uh, fast-changing data picture out of Europe and what that means for the ECB, along with some of the geopolitics this morning. Now, over to the banking sector and in banking news, Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman, expects most U.S. banks to withstand the current industry turmoil, blaming it on the after-effects of the pandemic. Meanwhile, in Europe, Isabel Schnabel, the ECB executive board member, says banks have not seen a loss of deposits despite the recent financial stability concerns moment there is a lot of uncertainty about what the financial turbulence uh, means for us in the euro area overall i would say at this point it looks that uh, that uh, we have um, a somewhat smaller problem uh, than we are seeing uh, in the us so at least so far uh, it looks that um, uh, as if our uh, banks were uh, actually quite uh, resilient Joining us now, Michael Moore, Bloomberg Managing Editor for Finance. And this is a, an interesting contrast then across the Atlantic. She's talking, you know, we haven't seen bank runs here in Europe. We saw SVB UK, much smaller player in the UK than its bigger uh, namesake over in the United States. And that hardly really cut through the national headlines or not for very long. So uh, is she right to point to this difference, the fact that we haven't seen these, these runs in Europe? Yeah, we haven't. And, you know, some of it is some of the structural differences for uh, the Europeans, um, they haven't had these big investment books the way SVB did, didn't, have, didn't get quite hit by the rates there. Um, so this is, you know, one instance where the European banks have fared better. Um, you know, there still are some headwinds they're facing, but those are more on the earnings front than, uh, you know, on these fears about deposit outflows. The, the, the big story on banks, Michael, is that I guess the FDIC, when it's trying to um, plug this $23 billion hole after the collapse of SVB and Signature is going to put that kind of tax on big banks more than community banks. That's a very political story, isn't it? Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's precedent for these kind of special assessments. And, uh, yeah, they tend to lean on the bigger banks both because of their higher profitability but also, you know, as you say, that uh, it's more politically palatable to make... Uh, them pay up for it. There is, you know, typically the banks are going to have to pay, the banking industry is going to have to pay to build this deposit fund back up one way or the other. It's more about who shares in it and, um, and the timing.
All right, Michael, thanks very much for joining us. Bloomberg's Michael Moore talking to us about banks on both sides of the Atlantic. Let's get a look at some of the stocks that we're watching in the pre-market this morning. Restoration Hardware is one I got my eye on. Maybe people actually refer to it simply as RH now. Um, down 7% in the pre-market after missing analyst estimates. Not only with fiscal fourth quarter sales and profit, it also gave a disappointing outlook for the fiscal first quarter and fiscal 24 missing on its revenue forecast as well as operating margins. So things don't look nearly as good as the street had expected for RH. Also, we have cruise lines gaining really across the board again today. That happened yesterday, but now in the pre-market, they're continuing to rise. Carnival, Royal Caribbean, Norwegian Cruise Line, all up on um, a spate of analyst upgrades over the past few days. You got uh, upgrades from an important analyst at Wells Fargo, as well as Susquehanna. You did get a downgrade on price targets from Citi, um, but they're really fighting the trend, bucking the trend. Cruise lines um, have been on a, a roll and they continue to rise. I want to talk to you also about a penny stock, Faraday Future, because it makes uh, electric cars, which I find a little bit exciting. Yesterday, it finally started production. It had a live like webcast or whatever you call it, showing that it um, started production of its cars. Of course, it's only a 44%, uh, 44 cent stock, um, but it's up 25% this morning, so nothing to sniff at. If you've uh, got thousands of them, you're still making a lot of money on that. And I also want to talk about Schwab. This has been a stock that a lot of people are watching very closely because of how much uh, retail money it has. Not as many uninsured deposits, not nearly as much in terms of uninsured deposits as a bank like SVB, but clients are pulling cash out of the firm's low interest rate bank accounts at twice the rate that Morgan Stanley analysts had anticipated. Of course, if you're not getting paid by holding cash in Schwab, why wouldn't you put your money somewhere else that pays you more or into money markets where you get, you know, two or three times as much? So, Anna, this is something that we continue to watch. Outflows here in the U.S. are, are, are a real issue. Yeah, certainly something to watch. Barclays have been quite vocal in the U.S. context, talking about what they expect to see there and the, the role that money markets play as competition for places to put your money is an interesting one. Uh, coming up on the program, we'll talk to Sebastian Riedler, head of European equity strategy at Bank of America Global Research. Lots of different sectors to talk about with him. I was drawn to some headlines around the luxury sector earlier on, uh, the value, uh, the, well, the valuations of those luxury stocks compared to the rest of the market. And we'll talk to Annika Trion, Van Landschot Kempen's chief economist. Lots to discuss. PC data due out later on today. That could be a focus. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. And Anna, you were talking about, you know, the rate that banks pay versus money markets. We were both talking about that um, uh, at the end of the last block. And I saw this chart earlier. I don't know if Valerie Titel put it together or Daniel Curtis, our uh, genius producers in London. But it's a fantastic illustration of the delta here. Just unbelievable how low uh, banks are still um, rewarding investors or depositors, I should say, for keeping their money uh, there. The interest rate, less than half a percent um, in terms of the average what, of what you get on uh, banks' savings accounts. Meanwhile, money market T-bill rates are 4.7 percent, so so much more. And that's why you see these deposits flowing out of U.S. bank accounts and into things uh, like money markets, a lot of times at, uh, out of banks and into brokers dealers. Joining us now to talk about this is Noor Al-Ali, Bloomberg Markets Live editor. This is one of the concerns, right? This is one of the big stories post-SVB. And I wonder if banks are going to have to make this delta up here or if we're going to see uh, money market rates come down. Noor, what do you think? Absolutely. And good morning. I mean, I think the one thing that it really does highlight, and I know that the latest depo, the, the, the deposits data is going to come out later tonight. So we're going to get a bit of an insight as well on what that looks like in the aftermath of the market calm of the fallout of SVB. And that's a little bit of a whirlwind there. But I think what it does is that it really it shows us, you know, with the, with the Fed expanding its balance sheet just to kind of accommodate these concerns about tightening financial conditions could really unwind those, you know, effects of quantitative tightening 
tightening. And if you look at it from a wider scope here, it shows that banking stocks potentially don't have the scope to do very well relative to, I would say, for instance, tech, which is likely to do very well when we see the, you know, when we see the Fed expanding its balance sheet, when we see money markets, you know, betting that the Fed is going to cut rates. I know that the Fed has pushed back on that, but, you know, Money markets are still very convinced that the Fed, even the ECB and the BOE, are going to cut rates sometime this Crazy. year. Mm. You know, that's a, a stark, con stark contrast to what we've seen uh, just last month. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for bringing us your thoughts. And that story on global tech stocks and global banks uh, are available on the Bloomberg terminal by Noor Al Ali. Uh, really worth digging out to look at the contrast in performance there. For more market analysis, including that story by Noor, but the rest of the team as well, MLIV Go is the function to use. The Markets Live blog is there. This is Bloomberg. Back. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Coming up on this program, we'll speak to Sebastian Regler, head of European Equity Strategy at Bank of America Global Research. What does he make of the rally that we've seen in tech? How robust is the banking sector? Luxury stocks? Uh, what does he make of valuations there? I know his focus is on credit conditions. We'll get to all of that in our next conversation. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Buckle up your seatbelts while stock reversals have dip buyers on the brink of an historic year. Big U.S. banks may have to pay up. The FDIC faces almost $23 billion in costs from bank collapses and may shift a larger-than-usual portion of that burden to larger lenders. And the inflation rate in Spain falls almost in half, but persistent underlying prices pressure uh, that's causing problems for the ECB, of course, as it decides how much to raise interest pressure. rates. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. So the focus on inflation here in Europe, some good signs, but some warning signs as well when it comes to core numbers and a focus on US PCE a little bit later on today. Right, I guess the base effects um, this time last year were strong. Uh, so as a result, we see lower inflation than had been anticipated. We're waiting for those data points to come out of the US and of course we'll bring them to you as soon as they do. We have uh, some inflation data tomorrow, but really the big PCE uh, data uh, today, but some of the big PCE data uh, tomorrow as well. S&P futures up four tenths of 1% right now. And we had a pretty decent rally yesterday in the cash trade up one and a half percent on the S&P 500, up almost 2% on the NASDAQ. As you may have heard, the NASDAQ is now in bull market territory because it's risen more than 20% since uh, its low, which was December 28th. So really just a great quarter for tech stocks, boosted over the last few weeks by people buying global tech when they were getting out of bank shares. You also have uh, interest rates rising just a little bit today because investors are getting out of uh, the perceived safety of government debt. I guess that's a good sign. On the other hand, it offers some uh, competition to yields on stocks. The U.S. dollar index definitely a tailor a, a tailwind for for risk assets. It continues to come down. Now, if this was a safe haven uh, trade, you know, and people were freaked out, it would be gaining like it was last year. We saw it at 1350 and change. Um, but it's really weakened as uh, investors grow. I guess more sanguine. They haven't really been flowing into uh, the end. They haven't really been flowing into uh, the franc. They're um, are clearly uh, still buying risk assets. NYMEX crude rising 65 cents to 73.62, but the outlook may be a little bit bearish because uh, puts are more expensive than calls, even though WTI could replace Brent in the dated benchmark. Take a look at some of the pre-market movers. Restoration Hardware is one that missed on its fourth quarter results, missed with its outlook. It uh, disappointed analysts um, with its first quarter and fiscal 2024 outlooks, missing on revenue as well as operating margin. Um, but you've got uh, cruise lines doing quite well. Carnival representative of the group as I think the biggest pre-market gainer, but you've also got Royal Caribbean uh, and Norwegian Cruise Lines uh, rising. Faraday Future Intelligent Electric, what's it called? Faraday Future Intelligent Electric is the full name, but um, they make kind of cool looking, very niche electric cars, and they started production yesterday. It's a penny stock, uh, but it's gaining big in the pre-market this morning. And then Schwab is one we're watching closely in terms of 
depositor outflows. Clients are pulling cash out of the firm's low interest rate, comparatively low interest rate bank accounts at twice the rate that Morgan Stanley had anticipated. And as a result, this stock continues to fall in the pre-market down 2%. Anna, what do you see in terms of the European trade? Yeah, here in Europe, we see uh, investors buying risk assets, as you were describing there, Matt. So European stocks up by just shy of 1%. Uh, the stock 600 is up uh, quite substantially this morning, continuing the gains that we've seen earlier on this week, making up that lost ground from Friday's heavy selling, which we saw focused around the bank sector, but weighing on the overall market uh, here in Europe. This is the euro up by two-tenths of 1% this morning. Maybe it's the dominant risk-on theme that's sending money out of the dollar and into other currencies that's, that's in the driving seat here. But we've also had that inflation data that we mentioned in our headlines, various regions of Germany and the Spanish national number, all of that moving in the right direction in terms of seeing a little bit of weakness come through, a drop year on year in inflation rates, which will come as, a, as comfort for many, even if core inflation remains quite sticky and a concern for the ECB. Drax Group, an energy business in the UK, getting subsidies for some of the things it's doing over in the US through the Inflation Reduction Act failing to get uh, into a UK program that would have been around carbon capture for its biomass energy business here in the UK. And a lot of people uh, drawing an interesting contrast between the two experiences there. H&M is up by 16% this morning. The retailer over in Sweden really countering the negativity we saw in retail stocks just yesterday. Next reported yesterday. That was a, a down weight on the sector and that weighed down on European stocks more generally. Today, H&M delivering a surprise profit uh, to do with the, uh, the second-hand clothing market. It would seem that's part of it but also getting on top of those inventory issues yeah inventory issues have been a problem obviously for uh, clothing uh, for retailers and some of them are apparently doing well lululemon yesterday had a huge pop on that let's talk about um, the broader equity picture with sebastian Raylor. he's head of european equity strategy at bank america global research sebastian thanks so much for joining us what, what do you think about this continued, it's really a risk rally that we're seeing, right? Um, a bounce back from uh, the fears of banks. We haven't had one collapse in over 72 hours. Does that mean that those banking concerns are behind us? I think the banking concerns might be behind us because regulators have been extremely fast and extremely determined in addressing them. But from our perspective, the main issue remains unaddressed, which is there is going to be a macroeconomic, there's going to be a growth price to pay for the fact that you've raised interest rates by almost 500 basis points over the past year. Typically, it takes 10 months for the increase in interest rates to feed through to weaker growth momentum. So we think the next part of the story is a weakening in growth momentum, and that typically is the most reliable driver of equity market direction. And as a consequence, we think there will be another sell-off, and we see around 15% downside for the European equity market um, uh, until the third quarter. Okay, so good morning to you, Sebastian. You say credit conditions then have already tightened sharply due to aggressive monetary tightening. So does that mean all the pain is in the equity markets? Or, or from what you're saying, you see another leg down? Um, the, the pain is very clearly not in the equity market. So if you look at the equity risk premium, if you look at credit spreads, they're still very tight. And a lot of our investors, a lot of our clients are scratching their heads and say, why has mm. the market not reacted? And the answer is the number one driver of the equity market is growth momentum. U.S. growth is still running at 3%. PMIs are still above 50. It takes a time for, the, for this tightening of credit conditions to feed through into weaker growth. growth. Once it does, the equity market will react. Okay, and in Europe, we focus on a number of sectors that have a sort of real uh, resonance in Europe, I suppose. And, and one of those is luxury. And I was drawn to a chart that uh, our colleagues produced this morning that showed that luxury stocks are at a record premium to the broader market. And we've seen a lot of enthusiasm for China reopening, and maybe that's, that's what drives enthusiasm for handbags. Uh, but, but what do you make of that particular sector in the European context? So it looks very high. It looks very expensive. We are market weight because we, we are respectful of the China reopening. But now the question really is, what is going to be the main story, the main macro story for the rest of the year? Is it going to be China reopening on the positive side, or is it the fallout from a tighter credit, from a de deteriorating credit cycle and from tighter monetary policy? We think the second theme will be dominant, so we don't want to have any cyclicality in our portfolio. And at current level, so we're market weight luxury, but our bias is more to the downside because so much of the good news is priced in at a time in which the bad news will now become visible. What, what do you think about uh, earnings? You know, everyone seems to be focused on obviously the importance of systemic uh, uh, bank failures, but also inflation and macro policy. When it comes down to earnings, are stocks valued right? Are we valued, are we, have, are we pricing in a recession? Are we overlooking that? Yeah, so um, to repeat what I said earlier, I don't think we're pricing a recession. The easiest way to look at how much of a recession picture is in the price is to say, 
does the earnings forecast for the next 12 months, does it reflect what is likely going to happen in a recession? And the answer is no. You're within 2 3% of the peak that you reached um, late in, in 2022. So we see around 20% downside for the 12-month forward EPS for European equities. And again, these earnings downgrades will come once the growth weakness fully is visible and is fully uh, materializing. The second way in which you're not pricing a recession, the definition of a re recession is that risk premia are very high. Everybody is worried, everybody is scared, but risk premia are still very low. The market hasn't responded either on the earnings side or on the risk premium side. In in terms of European equities versus U.S. equities, I mean, at the beginning of the year, it looked like everybody wanted to go uh, overseas. Is that still the case, Sebastian? Do you still have that momentum? Well, you've seen a first pullback after a strong outperformance for European equities, and we think that pullback will continue for two reasons. Europe is a value play. As a consequence, it benefits when bond yields rise. And the outlook for bond yields will depend, A, on the growth picture and B, on the inflation picture. We think growth will weaken and inflation is going to fade because the main driver of inflation, which is supply chain stress, in our view, has already diminished dramatically. So if bond yields come down, then value underperforms growth and Europe as the value region underperforms the US, which is the growth region. Secondly, Europe is also the cyclical play and tends to underperform generally when growth weakens. So weaker growth, lower bond yields means value underperforms, cyclicals underperforms, and that's not good for Europe's relative performance. Okay, important uh, sector breakdown. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thanks for joining us. So Sebastian Radler, Bank of America Global Research. Coming up on the program, we'll talk to Annika Trion, Chief Economist at Van Landshot Kempen. And she'll be with us to talk about her thoughts on the US economy and beyond. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with Andrew Hollenhorst, City Chief US Economist. That's coming up in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Now, Spanish inflation plummeted as energy costs retreated, though persistent underlying price pressures underscored the dilemma for the European Central Bank as it weighs how much to raise interest rates. Regional German CPI prints have also been uh, trickling in this morning. We will get inflation data out of the, uh, the well, out of Germany as a whole later on today. Joining us now is Annika Trion, Chief Economist at Van Landschot Kempen. Uh, let's talk about Europe for a moment, Annika. And we had that Spanish number. I mean, incredible progress when you look at, I mean, it's base effects and it's a lot about energy, but still seeing inflation numbers falling from a six handle to a three handle just feels good, I suppose, when we've been looking for this for so long. But then there's the sticky core inflation. How much is that going to mean that the ECB has to keep hiking? Hi, yep. Yeah, good morning. Well, the ECB has a tough job because the ECB is working, A, working very hard to regain its credibility, having simply reacted too late after the whole transitory debacle. And second of all, the issue is that the ECB has to look forward. And if the ECB is not drastic enough today, the risk is that the ECB has to catch up later on, which will cause even more economic damage. So it's indeed, as you say, a tricky one. And so how much more hiking lies ahead then from the ECB, Annika? If the market is, if the dots are pointing to just one more hike from the Fed and if uh, Jerome Powell is, is, is telling uh, politicians and others to, to focus on those dots, if that's what we expect stateside, how many more hikes can the ECB get through? Well, this is exactly the thing we're worried about. And this is about, this also holds for the US, by the way. But there are two things that we're concerned about. One, we think the market is getting a bit ahead of itself in already starting to you know, pencil in actually policy U-turns, let alone no more hikes. Second of all, the actual impact of rate hikes really trickling through into the real economy and accidents happening as a consequence of that, for example, the SVBs of this world, those are concerning. And to specifically answer your question, we think the ECB has to do another hike. We think it could be an additional 50 basis points. And as long as the core inflation remains stubbornly high and sticky, also, you know, things like wage inflation, services inflation. It'll be too early for the ECB to just turn dovish. And, but what about the U.S., Annika? And by the way, good morning and thanks for joining us. Um, what, what, what about the, uh, the Fed? Because we have seen, for example, um, 
the yield curve inversion come in quite a bit. We've seen financial conditions tighten a lot with these bank failures. Um, are they ready to stop now? Do you think they're ready to pause or even pivot? Well, if you look at the data in the U.S., economic data has been much more resilient than we all would have thought. We have to be honest about it. Look at Q1. Look at the indicators for what Q1 GDP in the U.S. is going to look like. It's pretty solid. The issue is, so yes, the Fed has, a, the Fed has to focus on inflation and focus on you know, a strong labor market alongside that, the dual mandate. But the Fed is also focusing on and also looking at financial market stability. That's why they came in to rescue, you know, depositors when banks started to collapse. Now, if you take a step back, you see that essentially the oxygen is being pulled out of the markets and the Fed has to look at that. And what's the oxygen being pulled out? It's about um, money growth weakening. It's about credit growth slowing. It's about the consequences of tighter to monetary policy. So putting that all together, um, we believe that there is one more tightening round to go from the Fed, but then the Fed has to simply watch, observe, and respond to what is uh, happening. What, what, you know, we were talking about this, you and I, yesterday on Bloomberg Radio, and what I think is fascinating is that this you know, bailout happened for a lot of gigantic uninsured deposits. The limit was $250,000, but, you know, uh, people with more than $3 billion um, were, were bailed out here in deposits. Um, does that create real moral hazard? As an economist, does that concern you for the future? Because now, why would I even care? Why would I even look at my bank's balance sheet? Um, I'll just put the money uh, anywhere I want because I know I'm going to get saved. Yeah, we, uh, I fully agree. We discussed this yesterday. So it goes back into more philosophical stuff. What is the role of a bank in a working society? To what extent is the bank's role more of a utility, in which case the moral hazard does exist because, you know, policymakers have to protect depositors or are banks, commercial entities, which is about capitalism. And sure, they're going to put those deposits to work in, by definition, assets that are somewhat risky. And then you have this and then you have this issue. So it becomes it becomes quite a philosophical topic. I think what's more relevant, most relevant in today's world is we spoke about it yesterday. It's schizophrenia. On one hand, the, you know, the Fed is telling us, stop relying on the Fed puts, stop you know, expecting us to put a hand under the markets every time markets sell off. We don't mind if a recession comes. On the other hand, a banking crisis starts to appear and bam, we're there to protect mm. all depositors, even the big ones. And, and Annika, going back to that, what that means then in terms of where rates go in the United States, our colleague Simon White wrote an interesting piece on the Bloomberg Terminal talking about, on average, the Fed starts to cut rates six months after inflation peaks. We're now nine months after the peak in inflation. And so his argument is that the Fed is going to start cutting rates sooner than expected. Do you, give, uh, do you, do you think about those kind of arguments, even if it's not your base case? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it, the problem is we get into all sorts of semantics. So, yes... If you look officially at has inflation peaked, yes, it has. Do we expect that inflation will come down from its highs? Yes, we do. Why? You know, it's base effects. It's the dramaticism at which it went up in the first place. But that's all about comparison uh, levels, right? It's all about the, the comparison base. I think what's, what's more important is, is the Fed going to start cutting rates? Well, that depends on certain criteria, which is, is inflation anywhere near its target rate? The answer is no. Um, it depends on other factors around it. It obviously depends on the labor market and whether or not that, that continues to be strong. So I think it's, it's too easy in inverted commerce to say, well, if inflation has peaked, the Fed can start um, cutting rates. And we're concerned that a lot of the market is actually already uh, pricing this in. Annika, thank you very much. Annika Trion of Van Lanshot Campen, thanks for joining us this morning. Coming up, Europe's race for lithium. More on the steps the continent is taking to build up its EV industry and to secure the supply chain that that requires. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Now, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has been speaking in Brussels ahead of her visit to China. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Oliver Crook, who's live for us in Berlin. Oliver, how is she looking to open communications with China? It's clear that the role China is playing in, well, with Russia and in Ukraine is going to be crucial here. So this is really interesting. So with some of the headlines coming from the, the speech is all about opening and continuing dialogue, but a lot of the speech was very sort of hawkish, and it kind of em emblemizes this frenemy status that China has here with Europe, where on the one hand, they're cognizant of all of these dependencies that they have um, on the nation, but on the other, don't want to totally close dialogue. So let's just summarize some of what she said. Um, so she says that it's clear that China's goal is systemically to change the international order, to put China at the center, that the nation has turned the page on opening free markets and open trade, and that has moved more towards control and closing up and security. And she says that the biggest risks to Europe are in industry and in military. Military, and this is particularly true of raw materials. And she name-checked lithium a number of times. Uh, and so she's talking about not de uh, decoupling, but de-risking. You know, and she says that the EU is dependent on China for 98% of rare earths, 93% of magnesium, and 97% of lithium. Um, mm. And that is because they have a much further developed raw material policy. Their companies are way ahead, particularly on refining. Yeah, I know that um, it's not about, you know, where the minerals are located. It's about who has the refining capacity, and nobody else is really invested in this. A lithium refiner just broke ground on a facility in Germany this week. Um, paint a picture for us as to how uh, supportive the German uh, government is of this and, and, and where else we're seeing refining capacity being put in. Right, so Matt, you have one refiner in all of Europe, and that's in the UK, and it did very, very small amounts of volume. And so now you have all of these companies rushing in. So RockTech is this Canadian company that broke ground this week, um, and, and they're here east of Berlin, and they're trying to feed the auto sector for what is going to be a huge amount of appetite for lithium. And this is the problem. Germany needs to secure the supply chain for this, this, rock lithium. And this is what they're going to process. They're going to break this down, heat it up, treat it, and that is what's going to go into these car batteries. By the time this facility comes to action, that's 2025. By the time it's fully operational, it's enough for 500,000 cars. They have a 40 percent uh, share is going straight to Mercedes. So I spoke to the, the, the CEO earlier, and the question is, is Europe far too behind, and are they at risk of permanently staying behind? This is uh, definitely a risk. Um, but I am very sure, and also out of uh, a lot of personal meetings, that the European politicians are aware of this topic. And uh, I see a significant change in the attitude here in, in Europe since this IRA program has been passed. So the alarm signs are clearly here. The politicians are willing to act. Now we will see in the coming weeks uh, if they will be able to. So the alarms are ringing in Europe. The alarms are being rung from the, in the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States, from China. Um, the question is, are they loud enough for Europe to move fast enough to get all this capacity on board quickly? Oliver, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook joining us there in Berlin. Thanks for the focus uh, on lithium. And very timely, as he pointed out, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, talking about Europe's reliance on some commodities coming through from China, the importance of that China-Europe relationship right now, despite all of the geopolitical challenges. So we'll continue to focus on that. And we'll watch Ursula von der Leyen's visit that she makes. She's going to China with Emmanuel Macron, the French president. We'll bring you coverage of that. That is it for Early Edition. Surveillance is ahead. We will hear from Christian Neuer, Bank de France, on Honorary governor. Uh, lots to talk about, about in terms of where the European rate story goes from here. We've had this really big drop in Spanish inflation, a bit of a drop in German regional inflation as well. Looking for that national number a little bit later on. Will that be moving in that right, softer direction, if you like? Uh, we'll also get PCE data a little bit today, but mostly tomorrow out of the United States. This is Bloomberg.